Back in the eighth grade, there was this English class where I suddenly got introduced to the art of debate. I gotta tell you, I love debating. Oh, the joy of discovering that you could argue as an art form. It's legitimate. Now, I remember the first topic I was ever assigned. It said, be it resolved that human progress is an illusion. And they asked me to argue in the affirmative. So, in my own childish way, I think I did a pretty good job. I remember arguing that time-saving devices and scientific advancements have a way of making us, well, lazy. So, where we used to wash dishes by hand, now we've got a machine. Where we used to shovel the driveway by hand, now we had a machine, and, and, and so on. And the picture I drew back then of our future as human beings was, well, not very flattering. I said, we're going to become fat and lazy, and we're going to fall prey to lifestyle diseases. So therefore, I argued, progress is nothing but an illusion. So that was about the extent of my combative prowess when I was, what, 12, 13 years old, eighth grade. But you know something? Now that I've had another 40 years to think about this, I really am convinced that human progress is an illusion. So you might want to stick around for another authentic experience because I think you're going to find this pretty interesting. At the end of the 19th century, there was this wave of optimism washing over most of Western civilization. The Industrial Revolution, the advances we had made in the world of science, our new political know-how, we said it was all going to result in this new era of peace and prosperity. And, and everything at the Paris Exposition proved it. It put it on display. This fair was a celebration of human ingenuity. And there were actually prominent people standing up in public venues declaring that the terrible spectacle of war would now be a thing of the past. This would never happen again because, after all, human beings had now unlocked the secrets of the universe. We were masters of our own destiny, and we said that the natural good that resides in our hearts would mean that all of our technology would become a force for good. Utopia, we said, just around the corner. But of course, by 1914, that was a joke. Because practically the whole world went to war. And by the close of the 20th century, we had killed more than 200 million people. What we did was take the efficiency of our new technology and we applied it to mass destruction. Now war was far more efficient than it had ever been at any time in the past. I mean, think about this. We used to line up in rows on opposite sides of a field dressed in bright red uniforms, and we took turns shooting at each other. It was almost civilized. But then we moved to the trenches, and we used machines to make death faster, cheaper, and more methodical. What did we do with all this new knowledge? We did exactly what we did before we had the knowledge. We may have fixed some of our technical deficiencies, but we didn't even make a dent in the human condition. I would argue, in fact, we actually made it worse. So, of course, that came as a bitter surprise for lots of people because back in the 1800s, Charles Darwin assured us we're all progressing in an upward direction. Existence might be brutal and painful in this world, but at least things are getting better. We're evolving. We're actually going somewhere. Then people like Karl Marx told us society itself was evolving towards something better. But then consider the sad case of someone like Ernst Haeckel, who came up with this idea that human fetuses go through all the various stages of evolution while they're in the womb. We start out as single-celled beings, then we become multi-celled life forms, and then eventually we look like fish or reptiles or monkeys, and then after nine months we become actual human beings. Now, you can still find that theory in a lot of biology textbooks to this day. You might remember it. They call it ontogeny, recapitulates phylogeny. But what they never seem to ever tell you is that Haeckel faked his drawings to make it look like all fetuses across all species 
are exactly the same in the beginning stages. He was so desperate to make this point that he actually lied. Now, some people might say, well, no harm done. It's just a set of drawings. Except that what Haeckel did was reinforce a very dangerous mindset that grew out of Darwin's theory. At the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th, we took these ideas and we started to compare the various races of humanity. And we told ourselves that if we could see visible differences between human races, well, that was because some of us were more evolved than others. And that made it easy to justify the death camps of World War II, because after all, it's just a matter of a master race doing population control on lesser evolved races. No big deal. This kind of thinking was far more prevalent than you and I probably want to admit. We are not just talking about the Nazis. All those racist ideas that Hitler took to the bank, those were incredibly popular during the 1920s and 30s, right here in America, where something called eugenics was all the rage. Eugenics is the art and science of controlling reproduction, of breeding for purity, as if the human race is a herd of cows or a stable of racehorses. This was an attempt to take control of evolution, systematically removing negative traits and promoting positive traits to breed an advanced race of humans. So again, we're not just talking the Nazis. Once upon a time, believe it or not, we were forcibly sterilizing people here in America, people we thought were undesirable and we didn't want them to reproduce. Margaret Sanger was giving public lectures where she talked about using birth control as a, quote, process of weeding out the unfit and preventing the birth of defectives. She complained that the, quote, consequences of breeding from stock lacking human vitality always will give us social problems and perpetuate institutions of charity and crime. The big idea was that you could take control of the evolutionary process and speed it up by using human reason. Now, I suppose from a purely rational point of view, that might make a little sense. I mean, what if you could breed certain diseases out of existence? But from an ethical point of view, think about what we were saying. Some human lives, we said, are worth more than others, and we can just dispense with inferior people. Given the dark and selfish nature of the human heart, we used that kind of thinking and promoted racial tribalism. If other people look different from us, well, we said that's because we're higher on the evolutionary ladder. And that infected a lot of our thinking. Back in 1862, we had this guy by the name of John Down who gave us the name for Down Syndrome. That's what we call it today. But that's not the original name he gave it. No, he actually called it mongoloidism. Why? Well, because some of the facial features of Down Syndrome patients seemed a little bit Asian to him. And because Down Syndrome patients faced some developmental challenges, John Down assumed they must be less evolved, members of a less advanced race. He was an out-and-out -out racist. So we, we took this idea of progress and evolution and we actually used it to make ourselves more racist. And now what we've done is we've swept a lot of that history under the rug because it's just too embarrassing to admit it. But I assure you, this is the truth about who we are and how we think make all the advancement in the world, invent all the technology you want, and you're still going to discover that our hearts are just as dark as they ever have been. In fact, sometimes in some ways, it actually makes the problem worse. We can cure diseases. We can extend a human lifespan just a little bit. We travel further and faster than we ever have before, but for some reason, we have done absolutely nothing to make ourselves morally better. Now, I've got to take a quick break, but stick around. I'll be right back with more. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. 
So here we are at the beginning of the 21st century, and the human race really hasn't made much progress, not morally speaking. Every time we promise ourselves that we're going to fix all the big problems, we actually seem to make them worse. So let's go back to Karl Marx for a moment, who took the idea of evolution and applied it to the world of politics. He convinced himself that the biggest problem we have can be boiled down to who owns the means of production. And he convinced himself that eventually the working class is going to overthrow the people who own everything and take control for themselves. That, he argued, would eventually equalize the human race and society would evolve into something better, not just biologically now, but socially. The communist revolution, he said, is the next logical step. But of course, what actually happened is that every single attempt to carry out a communist revolution in the 20th century caused more pain and suffering than it ever solved. Something like a hundred million people were sacrificed at this Marxist altar of human progress because we started treating people like they were means to an end, disposable objects on the road to utopia. And the most notable Marxist experiment, the Soviet Union, there, the ruling class ended up living like kings, while their dissenters died in gulags. To achieve his economic and political goals, Stalin systematically starved millions of Ukrainians because, again, people were disposable. Human individuality, human worth was buried under the dreams of a powerful few. And maybe they said they were doing it in the name of humanity. Maybe they said they were doing it in the name of progress, but what we got was another vivid example of everything that is wrong with the human race. I know, we like to think we're evolving, but honestly we're not. And it's exactly on this point that the perspective of the Bible suddenly starts to make a lot of sense. You see, one of the things that makes some people uncomfortable when they read this book is just how honest it is about human nature. It doesn't pretend that you and I have a magical ability to snap our fingers and eliminate all of our worst problems. And after thousands of years, we have to admit that the Bible might be right. We can't seem to fix ourselves. I mean, we keep telling ourselves that we can become less selfish. We can become less violent. We will become less corrupt. But not once in thousands of years has that ever happened. Which brings me to the ancient book of Daniel, where you find something fascinating that completely flies in the face of social Darwinism. And what I want you to ask yourself is this. I mean, maybe, maybe you don't place a lot of stock in the Bible, but when we look at what we're about to look at, I want you to ask yourself which perspective seems more realistic. Which perspective on human nature actually matches the real world? Is it true? that you and I are progressing and moving upwards because the universe has somehow ordained it? Or is it possible we're deluding ourselves and this old book is actually telling the truth? In the book of Daniel, you have this series of dreams and visions that deal with the rise and fall of human empires, starting with the Neo-Babylonians and then moving down through history. And in Daniel chapter two, the rise and fall of political empires is compared to, well, a metal statue made of different materials. It has a head of gold, a chest made of silver, belly and thighs made out of brass, legs of iron, and feet made with iron mixed with clay. Now the head is the Babylonian Empire, the silver, that represents the Persians, the brass, the Greeks, the legs of iron represents the Romans whose influence is still with us to this day. In fact, that's why you have feet made of iron and clay because when the Western Roman Empire broke up and became the nations of Western Europe, the spirit of Rome kind of hung around for a long time anyway. Now, there is a lot to explore in this symbolic representation of human government. But the thing I want you to focus on is the idea that these are all human governments. These are kingdoms built on human thinking, human principles. And throughout the course of history, every single one of these empires had one thing in common. All of them failed. Not one of them survived. Now, I'm pretty sure that when the Babylonians rose to power, everybody was brimming with enthusiasm. This was going to be a golden age. Human beings are finally going to prosper. 
and all will be well. But of course, if you build an empire under the influence of one larger-than-life individual, in this case a king named Nebuchadnezzar, well, that's always going to end in disaster because a human king is just a human being. Now, he might be an exceptional human being, but he still has all the same flaws that we have. So if you give this king a little bit of power, is he really going to use that for the benefit of everybody? I mean, really? Or is he going to be just like the rest of us and use that power for himself? Every single time we have had a major historical shift of power, we have repeated the same mistakes over and over and over again. We build the same monstrosities and people get used and people get hurt and all of our best intentions end up being yet one more showcase of human depravity. So here's what I want you to notice about this statue in the book of Daniel because this is fascinating. The metals used to represent these different empires have a logical progression. They run from the most expensive at the top, the gold, to the least expensive at the bottom, the clay. So you have gold, silver, brass, iron, clay. Each empire is a little less spectacular and a little less wealthy. Now, the people who built these kingdoms were convinced they were better than the people who came before them. But from the Bible's perspective, the opposite was true. The human race wasn't getting better with each new attempt to run the planet. It was actually getting worse, and human progress proved to be nothing but an illusion. I mean, think about it. I mean, we've always had warfare, but given enough time, we progressed from swords and spears and clubs to death camps and atom bombs. And while we like to convince ourselves that we are morally superior to the people who come before us, history demonstrates we're kidding ourselves. Now, here's the other thing about the statue I find fascinating. Not only do the metals deteriorate in value, but they also become more brittle with each successive empire. Gold is soft and malleable, easy to change. Not so much with silver, less with brass or iron, and eventually you get clay, which you can just break with your bare hands. So is it possible that an ancient book which happened to predict all these empires 2,600 years in advance, is it, is it telling us that our human condition is actually getting worse over time? Is it possible that way back when we were far more open to the voice of a loving and moral God, but then we trained ourselves to ignore Him and we became more and more resistant to meaningful change? Look, you've got to admit, it really does match historical reality better than this vague notion that the universe is blindly pushing us upward toward a better future. If anything, history has been teaching us that the opposite is true. We just keep repeating our mistakes, but then we make them bigger every time we do it. So now we find ourselves living in a postmodern world where we've almost given up on the idea that there's anything that you actually can fix. But more about that right after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. The statue of Daniel 2 shows us a progression of world empires from Babylon down to the present. And it says that you and I are sitting on the broken fragments of what used to be the Roman Empire. And instead of showing us a human race progressing upwards, it shows us this, well, bleak picture of a human race that can't solve its own worst problems. We have the technology, for example, to feed absolutely everybody on the planet. But still, we have people all over starving by the hundreds of millions. We have political systems meant to create civil discourse, ways of coexisting with each other. But honestly, I can't think of a time in this country when we had this much division and hatred. We invented the internet, this miracle of communication, a way to share our collective knowledge with everybody. And what did we do? 30% of the information on the internet is pornography. 
this horrible place where human beings are treated like animals, empty, meaningless objects, as if other human beings exist for our own twisted pleasure. Someone created social media, this platform where we could keep in touch with distant friends and family, but even that has a dark, seamy underbelly because, well, you have all these people under fake names using Facebook and Twitter to express the kind of hatred we used to hide from people before the internet made us feel anonymous and brave. Listen, go, go create all the technological solutions you want. Pass all the legislation you want. Write all the beautiful songs you want. Write all the beautiful books you want. And we still seem powerless to fix what's actually wrong with us. So you got to wonder, what's the solution? You know, there's an interesting story from the life of Martin Luther that took place in the wake of the Reformation. What had happened over the course of previous centuries was that human beings took something very good and once again made a mess out of it the Christian church was politicized. It had become a weapon in the hands of powerful people who used it to oppress others. And there's no two ways about it. Medieval Christianity was an absolute mess. So Martin Luther, among others, tried to fix the church by bringing it back to its original biblical teachings. And unfortunately, some of his followers got a little too enthusiastic and tried to use violence to speed things up. There was a riot in the city of Wittenberg where people burst into churches, stole all the books, drove the priests out at knife point, and they actually threw stones at people who were praying. Sound familiar? So Luther was horrified, the same way you get horrified when you see protests turn violent. And Luther said this, remember he warned that Antichrist, as Daniel said, is to be broken without the hand of man. Violence will only make him stronger. Preach, pray, but do not fight. Not that all constraint is ruled out, but it must be exercised by the constituted authorities. Now, don't miss what he said. He said Antichrist would be broken without the hand of man. In other words, God is going to fix our worst problems himself. And what's fascinating is the fact that Luther got that idea from the statue of Daniel too. Because after the rise and fall of all these world empires, you get down to the feet of iron and clay, and the vision changes. Listen to this. Here's what the Bible says. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Suddenly there's a fifth empire. It's different from the others because it's not man-made. The rest were built on human ingenuity and know-how, but not this one. So what does that represent? Well, listen to this just a few verses later. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to other people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand. And that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. So here's the truth about the human race, at least from God's perspective. For a long time, we've been trying to convince ourselves that we can fix what is wrong with us. We seem to think that we can conquer hate and selfishness and pain, and absolutely God expects us to try. But at the end of the day, human progress is going to fail. And I think the last five or 6,000 years makes that painfully obvious. What it's going to take eventually is a great big intervention where somebody other than us takes over. Now, we've gone through big resets before. We've had revolutions and wars and coups. And people still talk about a reset today, but none of them ever fixed anything. This has to be God's doing. This has to be done without us, without human beings ever touching it. So again, maybe you don't put a lot of stock in the Bible, but I'd encourage you to look at it again. A lot of what you read in this book is uncomfortable because it shows us like we really are, but at least it's honest. It confronts us with the truth about our flawed human nature, which makes this book worth considering. I mean, Marx and Darwin probably meant well, but look where trusting those guys got us. They sold us a lie about the future, a lie about the nature of human progress, and right now, we find ourselves standing on the graves of hundreds of millions of people who tell us those guys were dead wrong. So maybe it's time to reconsider something we used to take seriously. But we find ourselves hesitant to admit human nature is flawed. And if human nature is flawed, then so am I. And maybe the only real fix 
is the one we find in this book. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Sometime, if you get a chance, go and take a look at Revelation chapter 13 and you'll see this remarkable description of what we would call human progress. It describes this final beast power that oppresses people and forces them into submission. This is the end result of everything we've tried to build in the past, but this time it goes global and it's human wickedness on full display. So ask yourself, how many times will we have to suffer at the hands of well-meaning people before we finally admit we can't fix this thing? And all this time we've been ignoring this old book that tells us someone does have an answer if we just pay attention. I know we've been laughing at the Bible now for quite a few generations, but it's getting harder to laugh because every new day just proves this book really did have a point. I'm Sean Boonstra. This has been Authentic. Thank you.